We live in a society driven by our ability to consume and spend our daily lives surrounded by ephemera vying for our attention. But desire, as we've discovered, is subjective. What makes us want the things we want? What does it do? Like any successful object, it projects certain values and ideas about its owner. That's to say, good-looking and useful. It's a very classic design, and you take the top off and put the jug on, it does everything. If you just look at it, it is a sensational piece of style. It is probably one of the greatest handles I know. As we've illustrated throughout the series, the objects we accrue are an indispensable form of self-expression. But there's another reason we want the things we want, and that's a desire to test our ingenuity, to marvel at our powers of invention and innovation, to look to the future and see what's possible. After all, inventing the future has been a compulsion for man since his wife created fire. In this episode, I'll be exploring how crucial innovation is in igniting desire for particular objects. And I'll be asking many of the designers I meet to donate a piece of their work for our grand finale, the charity auction. Across nations and centuries, humans have embraced innovation and sought to create better tools to improve their lives. Indeed, one of our defining features as a species has been our invention of tools. We're drawn to innovations that promise to make us travel faster, work more efficiently, and enhance our creativity. Imagine, for instance, what life was like before certain objects. Today, dishwashers, fridges, people hardly think about them that much, really. They're just a given. But they fit beautifully and seamlessly into the everyday home because they've been thought through very carefully by generations of designers. But where are our most innovative designers leading us today? Can they offer me a glimpse of the future they're inventing? I'm going to meet five designers who are at the cutting edge of forward-thinking design. Their business is inventing solutions to problems we didn't know existed. This intriguing rolling bridge is a perfect example. Later on, we'll see how what we invent today will filter into our homes tomorrow. Designers are challenging our notions of functionality. This bridge has been conceived by designer Thomas Heatherwick. We might find his work in progress impressive, but Heatherwick himself has wider ambitions. I was interested in trying to find a simpler way to mechanically make a bridge get out of the way so that ships could go through. So it's a pedestrian bridge, straight, sort of simple, would there be a man standing there doing that with the handle? Yeah, yeah. The giant. <laughs> it's very modern. <laughs> I, I was interested in the way that when, when they rolled up, they made these kind of hearts that would be just sitting in the river. So it's, uh, I think it's quite a simple thing to make. I just need to find a mare of a city or a, and a river. Everything Heatherwick makes defies conventional classification. This is his Seed Cathedral from the UK Pavilion at the 2010 Shanghai World Expo. It was constructed out of 60,000 transparent optical strands, each encasing a different seed in its tip. Fluid stairways that appear to mimic moving water created out of aerospace materials. A sculpture at the Wellcome Trust in London made out of glass spheres suspended on steel wires with 15 tons of glass and almost a million meters of wire. Heatherwick's objective is to make ordinary things special, 
Widely acknowledged as the most inventive and innovative designer in the UK, Heatherwick was accorded the honor of an exhibition at the V&A during the Olympics. He approaches his work with childlike wonder and loves more than anything to invent. Take, for example, one of Heatherwick's most desirable objects, the spun chair. This is sitting down, but not as we know it. It enables you to spin 360 degrees. I was having so much fun that I forgot my propriety and began making design suggestions. There's, there's also a thing which is you have to do a certain amount of rotations for it to go all the way back to the beginning again. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, I'm not very good at heading in the right How direction. But you know, can I make another suggestion? Not that I, I, I know I, anything. I'll get someone drawing it up if you what want. What about um, <laughs> some padding? We could do that. It would be so lovely if you put your bum in it and, and, it, it, was a it, and it was, yeah, like a proper chair. This chair is playtime for adults. Its appeal is partly down to the way it transforms a dull chair into a spinning top, adding adventure to functionality. Designers will try to improve our lives, but for many, their real ambition is to change our behavior. I personally am, am interested in progress, possibilities, and, ha and I've always been interested in what these little tiny human, human beings manage to do. It's amaz it amazes me what um, human beings have managed to accumulate over these centuries. There's a hunger whenever there's someone makes a step in some way, whether, what, whether that's in food or theatre or film or, um, or architecture or transportation, people are really interested and, and hungry to experience that. And I think in some way it's what makes you feel alive. The innovation we see in the end product is the culmination of months and sometimes years of bright ideas behind the scenes. This is the studio's workshop. Um, what happens? I mean, it's a, this is where we test out ideas, really, and experiment and uh, do our worst experiments, and, but things that tend to eventually maybe give you the idea for a good thing that will turn into something. Can you so, tell me about some of them? What's the, what's the, the this, this, I'm, I'm trying to say it was pink or red or orange or uh, I don't want... Well, wow. so that yeah. is a, a transforming object. And you can just put, that's amazing. And so you can obviously apply that to all kinds of different uses. Well, maybe you could tell us which one's next, because <laughs> that's what we're interested in, is, is taking it the next stage. And that's exactly what we find, is something that we might explore in a building project. So we realise that there's maybe something interesting that that could do at a small scale. Heatherwick's free association system means that he experiments with everything, from the low-tech to this high-tech aerospace-inspired bench. The desire to be a pioneer is also a characteristic of the next designer I'm about to meet. If any designer's work has been elevated to the realm of art, it has to be that of the Australian Mark Newson. His pieces are cutting edge, futuristic, and perhaps most importantly, fun. He's designed everything from a jet to a wristwatch. He's exhibited at the likes of the Gagosian Gallery, and his Lockheed Lounge chair has fetched millions as a work of art. Surely he has the key to human desire. Like many of the designers I'm coming across, what drives Mark Newson is an ambition to invent the future. I didn't even know the existence of design when I was a kid. You know, all I wanted to do was make things. My, my whole desire to want to design things is simply to want to create objects that don't already exist. It's to sort of offer another solution or to offer an alternative to what's out there. You know, I had this vision of this sort of amorphous metallic object, but I had no idea how I was going to make this thing, which is in fact why I ended up studying to become a jeweler and, and a silversmith. You know, I didn't study design. And, and it was through the skills that I picked up that I was able to sort of realise this piece. Um, I was obsessed with sort of futurism and, and the space and, um, you know, I can still remember when they landed on the moon. And, you know, when, when, when the future was futuristic, which is kind of not anymore. Plant the flag of the United States in the lunar soil, we perhaps wondered what dream dreamt today by what impractical dreamer 
will be tomorrow's reality. The objects Newson produces are desirable because of their originality, and in many cases, new materials and technologies offer the wherewithal for his designs. You know, materials are of the utmost importance. Not only materials, but materials, processes, technologies, you know, all of those things, you know, that, that they're things, they're my, um, that they're what fuel me. You know, that, that's my kind of syntax, you know, that's how I, you know, that's, you know, that, that's my sort of dictionary. You know, for a writer, if I didn't have all of those things to draw upon, I wouldn't be able to kind of construct a sentence very well. So often it can be a case for a designer of, of simply appropriating and using materials in, in, in different contexts. Newson looks at everything we do and then tries to reinvent it, running the gamut from surfboards to geometrical shelves. You know, people, I think, understand now that design can make a difference to people's lives and sort of improve people's lives in, in, in certain ways. You know, when things just work very well, you know, it's, it's a relief at the very least, and it's a kind of pleasure at, at, at best. Mark Newson's Lockheed Lounge is similar in style to Ross Lovegrove's speakers. After the break, I'll try them out to see what a hundred and forty thousand pounds worth of stereo system sounds like. Beautiful and innovative, Ross Lovegrove's speakers could be exhibited in art galleries, but are they worth the high price tag? They sound just as great as they look. Although each approaches innovation in a slightly different way, Newson, Heatherwick and Lovegrove are producing objects which are desirable because they change the world as we know it. Their designs are the perfect combination of art and science. Known as Captain Organic, nature and the human form influence much of Ross Lovegrove's work. This water bottle is a great example, designed to resemble the element it contains. His designs are strangely futuristic, and he's turned his hand in everything from a bio-yacht to a solar tree to a Swarovski car. Perhaps fittingly, his studio is described as a cross between natural history and NASA. Let's see what that entails. This is like a, a museum of your, uh, yeah, it's up. of your objet. Lovegrove calls his work DNA, design, nature, and art. He fuses all of these elements together to create new futuristic objects, bikes made out of bamboo, chairs inspired by human bones and fossils, and super light suitcases. It's Can okay. I try? Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's excellent. You could get even onto EasyJet with that. <laughs> I see myself as a sculptor of technology. I'm a sculptor first and foremost. That's what really moves me. But what I'm trying to do is share those forms with industry so that people can actually participate in this. And that can be a watch or a piece of transportation, could be an aircraft or something very simple like a door handle. So this uh, research that I do in the studio, which is a really ongoing thing, is to see how we can harness the intelligence of nature. I love how he's harnessed nature to revolutionize something as everyday as a street lamp and invented something that works on many levels. You've got to think about it a different way from a single street lamp made in concrete with a horrible sodium head on it. Uh, this, if you look at the economics of this, it has ten heads which collect energy and four which deliver light. Normally it comes with a bench underneath it, so people can read a newspaper at night. The second level is that you can recharge your phone or your laptop or iPad through the tree, so you get free energy from... Do you mean you plug it into yeah, the tree? between the stems, yeah, little, little plug. And then the third generation, which is my dream, is to connect that with my, my car design for electric cars, so you can actually recharge your cars from it, so they become more than a street lamp. 
In an age of hot desking, creative work hubs and mobile phones, a street lamp that's sustainable, looks good and can charge your creative tools is bound to appeal. I couldn't resist the urge to badger Ross into donating the most beautiful light I saw in the studio for our auction. Ross, I know you've very kindly uh, agreed to donate us something for the charity auction and I think it's this incredible light over here. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, it's called Cosmic Leaf and it has this sort of um, <clears throat> what I call a dichroic surface. It's the way it's moulded. It's got these little facets that help uh, reflect the light. It's, uh, it's a kind of phenomenology. But... And at the end of the series, some lucky bidder will get to take that fabulous Lovegrove lamp home. Meanwhile, my search continues for the most desirable objects on this planet. Modern day urns, rubber furniture and horsehair vases. Just some of the amazing creations of Ian Stallard and Patrick Fredrickson, two of the most avant-garde designers working today. In common with the other designers I've been meeting, the workshopping of an idea is as crucial as the brainwave itself. To test out a new design for a table, Ian and Patrick are making a small-scale version out of clay. You have this moment when you cast something in ceramic where it's, it's become a solid, but it's still quite soft and malleable. Uh, it's a very fragile state, but also it's a quite interesting one in the way that you can manipulate. The problem is, is that on the kind of scale we wanted to work for for a table, clay can't really support itself, it becomes too heavy. So we wanted to make smaller um, clay um, cuboid forms like this, um, so that we could work with them and they'd have more structure and we could really push the, the way that the material moves. So what you do, you work in, in a certain scale, you use high technology to transform them into the pieces, the sizes that we initially intended them to be. And it's very exciting to, to work in such a way. It's exciting because it's kind of, this is very much hands-on craft techniques which we often use, but very much combined with technology now in terms of 3D scanning or robots actually creating these pieces. Newson is into outer space, Heatherwick into bridging the gaps, and Lovegrove turns to the earth. Ian Stallard and Patrick Fredrickson look to the world of fine art to feed their innovations. You have to have a relationship as well with the kind of pieces we do because they are furniture design, even though it is pushing the limits towards the fine art world. For instance, it'll be interesting with these tables because when you look at them, it looks like if you put a glass of wine almost anywhere on that, it's just going to, to lean and fall over, when in reality, almost all of that surface is flat. It's just that you have the sense of it being much more sculptural, much more flowing than it is because of the way that we've made it. So it's always interesting to see people's reactions as it being an art object. And we're saying, no, it's a coffee table. We've had this, we have one at home, we use it. It's fine, it works, it does what it's supposed to do, as well as being an amazing piece to have in your home and to really live with. One of their most famous pieces is the Pyrenees sofa. It may look remarkably like a mountain range, but it's surprisingly comfortable. Because the sofa sits people at different angles from each other, it apparently changes the way they interact. It's very social in that although it only takes up as much room as a, a three-seater sofa, you can fit five people on it without being too much on top of each other in this kind of very <clears throat> informal cocktail party kind of way. The v and has as an example of this design classic of the future in their permanent collection. Child inventors, dreamers of the future, all the designers I've been meeting are innovators, but in very different ways. What connects them all is that they extend the boundaries of conventional thinking, and we desire their objects because they improve and enhance our lives. Although some of their objects may feel obscure, elements of these inventions are trickling down into more conventional design. These inventions that complement our lifestyle are increasingly desirable.
The second part of my journey will be to explore how these innovative objects are spreading their influence into mainstream culture. If anyone is producing innovative objects for the mass market, it's Apple, arguably one of the most inventive brands in the world. The products they design create near hysteria in consumers. Queues form outside Apple stores each time a new gadget is released, and worldwide mourning for company founder Steve Jobs rivaled Michael Jackson. People talk about the cult of Mac, and there are Mac geeks who will tell you it's not a computer, it's a way of life. They live, work, and breathe their Apple Mac. But what is it about a gadget that can inspire this sort of football club-like loyalty? What fuels this unrequited, fanatical love affair? And bearing in mind their cynical exploitation of our desire for the latest upgrades, how do they maintain our loyalty? If we could unlock the secret of Apple Mac, we'd probably all be as rich as the late, great Steve Jobs. But why is Apple such a successful brand? Why do their products have so many disciples? The reason is partly down to the sleek, modernist aesthetic of their designs. In any recent Apple product, you can see a thing which is sheerly, magnificently gorgeous, beautiful, desirable, covetable, touchable. Jobs himself said, you know, an object's you know, well designed if you want to lick it. The Mac, the iPad and the iPod were conceived by Jonathan Ive, one of the most respected and admired British designers in the world, whose achievements were rewarded with a knighthood. He granted a rare interview for our series. Our goal really is to try and design an object that, that when you see it, um, in some senses, it's really, it's, there's no drama to it. You know, you certainly don't have a sense of its authorship. You don't have this sense that there's a designer wagging their tail. Uh, I think that we feel we've done our job when, when you sort of get that sense, well, of course it's that way. That's the only way to do it. But, but that's actually very difficult to get to that point. Apple create products that we didn't know we wanted until we clapped eyes on them. What's interesting about Apple is the fact that they don't have focus groups. They prescribe what they think people should be using, and then it's up to you, obviously, to choose that. But their, their products are very sophisticated looking, sophisticated in the way that they work, and they invest a huge amount of money in producing those objects. So their products are much more expensive than a comparable one. But people buy it because they want to own that beautifully engineered, beautifully designed, beautifully working object. That unique approach to design is acknowledged as a key reason for their phenomenal success. And nothing here happens by accident. You know, the development of some of these products takes an awfully long time. And we will continue to iterate and iterate until it feels right. I mean, what drives us it's not a schedule, or it's, it's not a cost. It's trying to, to make the very best products that we can. Very often, I think, you look at products and you think, well, the goal there was actually, it was to be different. And difference is actually very easy to achieve. And when, you're, and when that's your goal, I think difference actually dates very quickly and becomes irrelevant very quickly. The change from generation to generation in some of our products it's a case of evolution. I mean, it's, it's a case of trying to make the product better and better. And one of the consequences of that can be that I think the, the, the products appear, um, they, they have a longevity to them. They, they, um, I think they stand the test of time. One of Apple's most iconic products is the iPad. Although 100 years older, the chalk slate looks remarkably similar to the iPad. Even the most futuristic inventions have connections to our past. The iPad to me is my lifeline because not only is it my portable um, photograph album, it's an amazing way to be able to keep close to my family and, um, and to share things and it's just the most extraordinary thing. Pure aesthetics can't fully account for the appeal behind Apple products. The reason why these objects are so desirable is because they offer possibilities the consumer has never even imagined before.
I think Apple has a whole bunch of psychics that actually go out and they actually read the future for about 10 years and then they come back with those products or they have a time machine. David Kassan is a painter who's turned to the iPad as a mobile sketchbook. I use it a lot in museums. I use it a lot on the street to do studies for paintings. And it's a great augmentation to my real paintings. It's a, it's a great sketchbook that's full color, dry media, it doesn't get all over the place. It's easy to carry with me and it's, it's instant. It's become a really valuable tool for me in learning how to paint as well as exhibiting my paintings to people and showing people what I do. I remember when the iPad came out, no one thought it was really a device to actually create upon, but it was more of a consuming device, and I think that it's really changed the way people think about creating things. Being able to shoot video with it, being able to create paintings with it, it's unique how that's being formed, and that, that's changing a lot of ways view people, people view art in general, and how it's created as well. But design is not the only area in which Apple is innovative. Their adverts deliberately associate the brand with famous thinkers and brave new worlds. Today we celebrate the first glorious anniversary of the information purification directives. The Macintosh launch ad, directed by Ridley Scott, has become iconic. A garden of pure ideas. It was in January of 1984, and they came out with what is possibly one of the greatest TV commercials of all time. And we will bury them with their own corruption. We shall prevail. That is the presentation of an archetype, the presentation of this creative sort of hero who will come and save us all from this terrible situation. The design, the technical possibilities offered by Apple, and the advertising all speak of innovation and creativity. The simplicity and coherence of the branding enhances the desirability of these objects. Every consumer touch point, whether it's an interface with any one of their products, it's the experience of walking into an Apple store, it's hearing their founder deliver a speech or seeing them deliver one on, on uh, YouTube. Um, there's a seamlessness and an integrity to the experience that's, that's never violated, at least as of yet, hasn't, hasn't been violated. And the consumer rewards you for that. Apple have embraced the radical thinking that's been a driving force behind humanity since the dawn of civilization. It's just a way of progressing, you know, human affairs, just like, you know, Clausewitz said, you know, war is an extension of politics, you know, by, by other means. Um, you know, the design and consumption and desire of objects is an extension of culture by other means. Although it's hard to imagine now, these objects in their time were deemed to be revolutionary. But not everything that was invented in the early part of the 20th century is similarly redundant. After the break, I'll be exploring an object which has remained an icon since its origins in 1934. The Angle Poise Lamp was created in 1934, a joint venture between the metal spring business of Herbert Terry and the car designer George Carradine. They had an idea to create a futuristic lamp with adjustable springs able to balance without a clamp. When, after 70 years, the makers of the angle poise wanted to update their classic design, they turned to a man who genuinely does merit the overused description of a legend in his own lifetime. I'm on my way for a date with design royalty. Few people can have had as dramatic an impact on our day-to-day -day lives as the octogenarian product designer Kenneth Grange. His designs combine usability with a sleek silhouette and include this taxi that I'm riding in, the Intercity 125, and a range of household names from Kenwood to Kodak, and more recently, the Angle Poise Lamb. I've asked Kenneth and Simon Terry from Anglepoise to explain its enduring appeal. The most valuable thing about, about design is when it makes something better. If it makes it functionally better, 
it almost doesn't matter what it looks like. I put, I put function, I put intelligent use, highest of all the merits of design. And when you were asked to uh, look at the angle poise and sort of reinvent it for, for, for a new era, there was nothing really to improve on, was there? I mean, it is a, it is a, a, a minor miracle of balance of engineering and it's stood all these years still untouched nothing's nothing's better than that so it's actually a genuine real invention and they're very thin on the ground real exceptional inventions particularly those that touch our lives so commonly why do you think it became so iconic because because of that miracle of its use you move it and it stays that in itself such an unlikely thing to happen isn't it Almost nothing else stays where you put it. Few lamps exude as much charm or character as the angle poise. It, it is a very quirky, unusual design, because I think if you look, look at it in the, sort of the history books of lighting design, you've got a sort of lot of Art Deco, Art Nouveau lamps up to it, and suddenly you get this light with all these sort of springs and mechanisms, and it, it doesn't belong there at all. It's, it's, sort of, it's almost alien technology, if you like, at the time. And, um, but I think people have grown, loved it for its honesty as a design, i.e. it just shows only the bits it needs to function. It's, it's, it's very utilitarian, it's, very, it's, it's a classic example that it's function first and then form second. It's an iconic product, overused word, but it's, uh, if we all grew up with them. I mean, where, whichever office you went into, um, I went, worked in a number of architectural offices, everybody had angle poise lamps. It was the only lamp that, and it gave you that wonderful privacy, that sort of focusing area, which is still one of the greatest merits of the thing. Turn it on and that's where you're going to be, it's where you're going to work, where you're going to actually enjoy yourself. But there are always those with an irrational fear of the new. An executive at the BBC legend has it barred this lamp because he believed that someone working in a confined space solely with the ankle poise would cultivate debased ideas and produce immoral programming, heaven forbid. It felt slightly immoral to ask an elder statesman of design for something for our auction, but I tried my luck and it paid off. I know that you very generously offered to donate this oh, wonderful yes. razor to uh, our charity auction which we're going to be having at the end of, of this series. Can you tell me a, a bit about it? It came from a firm in Redditch which is the home of Anglepoise. So there's a nice connection. But, and, and it's an ancient firm that made this, it, a firm called Needle Industries. And Needle so some lucky bidder will not only own a design classic but will be well groomed for the rest of his life. The angle poise is not the only object that tests the power of balance. The Tipton chair, invented by two renowned creative talents, Edward Barber and Jay Osgoby, does likewise. I'm about to join a classroom of prospective young clients to see what they think of this inventive design. Hello, excuse me. The Tipton chair was conceived for children to indulge their penchant for tipping back on their chairs when bored. Unlikely as it may seem, such fidgeting has been proven to help creativity. Increased muscle activity in the abdominal and back areas improves oxygen supply to the body, and that, in turn, has a positive effect on concentration. The way that children are taught now is very different from the way that we were taught, maybe you were taught, where you had a teacher at the front, everyone sat in rows, keep still, facing front. Now they're taught in groups, they tend to move around, and so we wanted to be able to get some movement into the chair. It's something that we've become accustomed to in the office. We're all used to having chairs that do Spooky all sorts chairs, of different things, yeah, you know, yeah. backward tilt, forward tilt, all those things. Um, but I, our brief to ourselves really was to create some, a chair which was really, really simple but had this element of movement in it. Because what we found out through research is that when you sit still, you basically go to sleep, your brain stops working properly. And it really encourages thinking and concentration when you fidget. Producing the mould to make this chair was no easy task. Vitra, a manufacturer of contemporary and classical furniture, subjected it to rigorous tests. In my day at 
at school, if I rocked in a chair, I think I would have been slapped on the wrist with a cane. I wonder what today's children make of a chair I could only have dreamed of. <laughs> Who thinks this would make school a bit more interesting? They're kind of colourful and kind of give the classroom a bit more kind of uh, power, like kind of light and happiness. Come on, who would want to have either one of these dull chairs or one of these cool chairs? I, I would have the cool chair. For instance, you're writing something really long and you've been slanting down. This is quite good because it kind of rocks forward so then you can actually stay in a comfortable position while writing. As well as the Tipton chair, Edward and Jay designed the Olympic torch, for which they won the Design Museum's 2012 award for most innovative and progressive product. It's the first time we've designed anything that has a sort of international interest to it. There were two things that we had to, to bear in mind, which is firstly sort of the uh, ergonomics of it, the actual physical, people have to run with this thing. And the other thing was to have a strong narrative behind it, so it wasn't just an object that sort of looked pretty. So. The first thing was that we sort of made shapes that, so that we could test how it feels in your hand. The, the reason that it's a triangular form, there are lots of threes or trilogies in, the, in their briefing, and one of them was the fact that it's the third time that the Games has been in London, so 1908, 1948 and 2012. So we reflected that in the shape. The task was not only a design feat, but a technical challenge as they had to produce 8,000 torches for 8,000 torch bearers within a tight deadline. There are 8,000 perforations in each torch as well. So there are 8,000 people carrying the torch, and there are 8,000 miles that the torch will be carried. It's two skins of aluminium, which are then laser cut by the world's fastest laser cutter. And then they're held together by two aluminium die castings, which form the top. How do you find the world's fastest laser cutter? We had to, because they've got to cut 64 million holes to make them. Yeah. And we only had a certain amount of time, obviously, to make it. So they had to find the fastest laser in the yeah. world. And, and th that's where? It's in Coventry, where they're being manufactured. As well as their high-tech commercial designs, Edward and Jay sometimes make more abstract pieces, which are exhibited in galleries. I grabbed the opportunity to snag another masterpiece for the auction. What, we, what we'd like to give you is this um, sketch, which is one of the original sketches that we did whilst we were designing the show. And this is, um, a, I suppose, a final sketch of one of the pieces that ended up in the, in the exhibition. A Barber and Osgaby print, a Kenneth Grange razor. With such booty, this auction is definitely shaping up well. The Olympics offered the opportunity for innovation in architecture too. Zaha Hadid designed the iconic aquatic center and her pioneering ideas make her one of our most futuristic thinkers. Few people challenge our preconceptions of what objects should do for us more than Zaha Hadid. As well as buildings, she produces furniture and jewellery designs, and all her work is surprising and extraordinary. I'm exploring this temporary structure designed by Hadid, which looks like it's landed from outer space. Her buildings, furniture and jewellery are unique in themselves, but also reminiscent of natural shapes and landscapes. Initially, she struggled to see her creations realised, and even now that many of them have been built, they remain indescribable and definitely revolutionary. Amongst her many futuristic designs is the Z car, a concept car that could be powered by an electric or hydrogen fuel cell. If you are left with objects that are completely without a reference in your own life or vocabulary, it's very difficult. If they're too close to your vocabulary, they're boring. And Zara has this gift of, of making shapes that are totally amazing, but then by this, the flow, by the emotional aspects of it, uh, they're also something that you, you can trust and feel good about. Zaha Hadid designs furniture as if 
furniture was a landscape. I mean, she takes a room and she'll put furniture around it as if the furniture's flowing through it, like a flow of desert dunes or um, a forest landscape or a mountainous landscape. It's that sense that you enter a room and it's no longer just an ordinary room, it's a place of visual and tactile adventure. The first display of Zaha Hadid's geological-looking furniture was at a house on Cathcart Road in London. It's fascinating to have the opportunity to see how her pieces act as an ensemble. I'm always like furniture. I, I did a house 25 years ago. I did a, a, a furniture for a house in Cathcart Road, um, which was, in a way, um, in hindsight, a very important project which transformed the interior. Even then, they were quite, like, soft. They were more than just furniture, they were like dividers of rooms. We were, we were interested in the idea of the clusters. I mean, if, you, if I put all these things, very squish them together, they would form a sort of a block. Clusters as a kind of, a, or aggregates, instead of things nesting into each other. Rather than chairs and tables occupying part of a space, Hadid believes they should define it. She's completely reimagined the purpose of furniture. Hadid uses the latest techniques to produce her floating pieces that transform our concept of space. And to create them uses an innovation called 3D printing. The nice thing about this furniture is that you can literally um, have an idea, you can draw it up quite quickly on a computer, and you can send it to a manufacturer and they can just mill it. You can make it out of aluminium or foam or... It's like sculpting, it's like chiseling away, but it's done through a machine or a robot. The technology Hadid uses revolutionizes the way in which objects are created. 3D printers build solid objects by layering dots of plastic material. Ultimately, we might all have 3D printers in our homes, which will save waiting for that elusive delivery van. At the heart of many objects we desire lies a curiosity and passion for innovation and tool making. These unique and extraordinary objects celebrate new materials, provide different experiences, employ inventive techniques, and ask us to look at the world afresh. Unlike Apple, I've no idea what the future will be, but as long as there are human beings, I've no doubt that inspired design will be at the heart of the world we live in. Humans are naturally restless creatures on the whole, but a bit like that sort of old cliche, you know, the shark has to keep swimming or it dies. Um, humans will have to innovate more if they're going to survive as a species. Humans do have a certain type of intelligence they're able to make things and create things and fundamentally design things and they can design their way out of problems one way or another. Next week is the final step in my exploration of design and desire. Throughout the series we've been collecting donations from some of the amazing designers we've encountered and in our last show we'll be testing their appeal when they go under the hammer at our fantastic charity auction. Model and activist Christy Turlington Burns joins her creative inspiration fashion designer Tori Birch as the new series of Iconoclast continues Thursday at 9.30. Mariella's back auctioning off those objects of desire same time next week, Tuesday at 8.00. <laughs>